Yes, so that is the proper management is correct. Proper management is having right people to govern the organization, is it? Yes. To have the right people. This is exactly what the corporate governance is all about. Having people with integrity, people with competency, people with uh, appropriate skills, people who can devote time to manage the mm -hmm. company is what we call the corporate governance. So basically, mm -hmm. corporate governance means you, the way it's a system, it's a, it's a kind of a system, it's not something ad hoc, it's a continuous system by which a company is directed and controlled. Right. If you really look yeah. at, there are two ingredients for any success of a business today. One is to have this right people. Second one is to have right information. I believe if you have right information and right people in the company, the company should be doing well. You can't run a company yeah. without right okay. information. You can't run a company without right people. So this is why in Petri we have something called information <coughs> strategy and we have something called corporate governance. So corporate governance is all to do with at the very top, the people. Now normally you will see at the very top, it is the board of directors. So board of directors, generally according to the UK model, there are two categories of board of directors. Number one, the executive directors. Number two. Is, uh, is that on the slide? It's on the slides, yes. Just, uh, oh, I'm just, uh, <laughs> just, uh, just, uh, just, uh, briefing you. So, corporate governance is a system by which the companies <coughs> are directed yeah. and controlled. So, in any company, mm -hmm. we have the board of directors or the governors. So, they direct and they control. What do you mean by direct? They yes. take the decisions. Mm -hmm. They take the decisions and they will pass it on to the lower levels for implementation. What do you mean by control? Yeah. They must see that their decisions, whatever they took, are properly implemented. So they need to have a, a control set back to know that whatever that was told to Nish had been carried out. So they will they will like to see whether Nish had carried out and that's the control system they have. For example, yeah. a company sets up a budget, right? And then they will monitor yep. the budget versus actuals to the control system to see whether you are working according to the budget. Otherwise, the budget becomes useless. Yes. You can have the best budget, but if it is not properly controlled, it becomes a useless tool. Right? So that's what corporate governance is all about. So corporate governance, basically, it allows the people to achieve your objectives in a prudent way and it gives prudent management. Prudent management means they are not the people who are going to take very high risk uh, kind of dangerous decisions for the company. They will look at the things overall, they will see the information available and take appropriate right decision. So corporate governance is good for every company when it's small or big. In the exam, they might say corporate governance is only for listed company. No, corporate governance is good for every company. But for listed company, in most of the countries, it is mandatory. UK, it is mandatory. The listed companies compulsorily should follow corporate governance. For private companies, they can follow. They may wait without following. Simply corporate governance will reduce risk because they will not take unnecessary risk. They will be very carefully calculated decisions. They will set mm -hmm. up a good supervision team to look after the affairs and they will work with good guidelines and they ultimately it will should enhance overall performance. And one of the areas aspects of corporate governance, a side benefit of corporate governance is good ethics. When you have good corporate governance, it means that your company will be following good ethical practices also. And transparent accountability. So this is what corporate governance brings. So 
So why corporate governance came? It was not there during our time in our syllabus. It came in somewhere in 1990s. The corporate governance came into this world. There were a lot of, lot of frauds happening in big companies where at the very top, the directors were up to a lot of mischief. They were defrauding the shareholders, defrauding the society, and there was a necessity to bring some kind of governance regulation. And also, there is this globalization. You are in UK, you might invest some money in a company in Sri Lanka. I'm, I'm in yeah. Sri Lanka, I might invest money in company in UK. I can't come to UK, you can't come to Sri Lanka all the time. But we need good financial reporting. And the financial reporting must follow certain proper guidelines. So for that purpose, the corporate governance gives certain guidelines how to prepare the financial reports. So you can rely, even though you are in UK, you can rely when the company has done good corporate governance, the report that is coming from Sri Lanka will be of some strength, some good kind of material for you. That is what yeah. the equality of foreign and local investors. It's all about financial reporting. And of course, it will be somewhat monitored, somewhat uh, amended, flexed to the individual country's needs. But overall, it will meet the international standards. And yeah. one of the pictures of the corporate scandals that are there. So there are two theories or three theories of corporate governance. The board of directors, we can consider board of directors as our stewards. We are given our money and they are our stewards. We are the shareholders. We have entrusted our money to them and therefore they, are, they, they become the stewards of the company. Stewards for the shareholders. So that's what we call stewardship theory. So you and I, if we just give our money and if we don't take any interest in the company, the stewardship will fail. We must ask them, what happened to our money? Why are you not paying a dividend? Why is company running at a loss? So the shareholders must take good active interest if the stewardship theory is practiced in the company. Then the second theory is that the board of directors are responsible not only for the shareholders, they are responsible for the stakeholders. Who is a stakeholder, uh, Nish? Who is a stakeholder? Shareholder is a person who um, owns shares in the company. Who is a stakeholder? Yeah. So everyone who has an interest in the company. Everyone who has employees, could be everyone who has yes. Yeah. Everyone who has an interest in the strategy of the company. Strategy. Yeah. Long-term interest of the company. Strategy means it's long-term. So not some person who is looking at tomorrow, but who is interested in long-term. So lenders, employees, environmentalists, government, all those become your stakeholders. The customers, suppliers, yeah. they become your stakeholders. So the board has a responsibility towards the entire stakeholder. UK is very much focused on the shareholders, but uh, South Africa and other countries are very much focused on the stakeholders. Then we have finally the agency theory. Agent means Shareholders are the owners, the directors are the agents of the shareholder, agents. So when they are agents, obviously if you appoint an agent to look after your work, the agent will be looking after your work true enough only for one purpose because he wants to earn his agency remuneration or agency commission. So he will put himself first before the principal. Agent is typically that. He's trying to maximize his earnings. So this was one problem we had in 2007, 2006 during that period. In UK, there was a big problem. The, the, the credit crunch came, the bank started collapsing, and then after that, the government came and gave a lot of assistance for the banks to get revived. And guess what happened after the banks got revived? The directors, they were starting to take big, big bonuses 
with the yeah. support they came and the, the whole community was very very critical of the bank director it's not only bank director if you look at most of the companies you can see directors they enjoy unlimited benefits and this was one problem mm -hmm. it's your money it's my money and yeah. finally you know, they money, but they take everything in form of bonus whatever that and ultimately nothing is left over to the shareholders that is because of the agency theory they care for themselves before looking at your principal so they have to set yeah. up certain kind of uh, guidelines even on the remuneration because remuneration became a big problem Basically, the idea of the governance is to achieve your strategic objectives, to minimize the risk, to promote integrity, the transparency, the truthfulness, straightforward dealings, responsibility to all stakeholders, and to establish clear accountability. And maintain independence of those who scrutinize your financial records or financial reports. Now, who scrutinizes the financial reports independently niche. When you prepare your financial statements, it is subject to some auditors. who external auditors. External yeah. auditors and internal auditors both, external auditors in particularly, they should have the entire independency to scrutinize the report. So what happened at a particular time, if you remember the Enron case, the auditors, yeah. Arthur Anderson, also were responsible liable for the fraud because they did not have the independency because they were almost, they became pawns in the pockets of the shareholders, the directors. Yeah. The reason, who appoints the auditors, Nish? Who appoints the external auditors to a company? The audit committee. Audit committee is, the, the auditors are responsible to the audit committee, right? But uh, who appoints the auditors, external auditors? Who is the ultimate appointing authority? Why are, the, why are the external auditors there? For what purpose? Who manages the funds of the company? Directors, isn't it? The directors, right? yeah. So, whose money it is? Shareholders. Shareholders. Right? So the shareholders want to know independently whether the directors have properly accounted for all the monies. So that is why yeah. we need external auditors and therefore external auditors are appointed by the shareholders and therefore external auditors report to the shareholders. If you repeat. Okay, so external auditors are appointed by, by the shareholders. At the annual general meeting. At the annual general meeting. Yeah. And they oh, report think, yeah. to the shareholders. So where does the audit committee come in? Yeah. Audit committee facilitate the independency of the external auditors. Audit committee is given the chance to ensure that the auditors will have the independency the freedom, no one will come and tell the external auditor, hey, you can't come to that table. Audit committee will ensure that they have the full freedom, full independency to do whatever they want to do to get themselves satisfied that the financial reports are done well. That's the idea. So then what, uh, so mm -hmm. the audit committee then is made up of non-executive um, directors. Non Executive directors. Yeah, all non-executive directors. Oh, and it is made up of non-executive directors. Okay. Right. So uh, the problem that cropped up was shareholders appoint Arthur Anderson, for example, in that company to do the audit work, and maybe they will pay. The company will pay for the audit work 150,000. But when the auditors are appointed by the shareholders, directors get them to do non-audit work. 
non-audit work, like tax consultation, like getting them mm -hmm. to do any feasibility reports, etc. And for those work, <coughs> let, let us say they are paying 300,000. Both the monies are going from the company's pocket, but shareholders work 150,000, directors work 300,000. Directors appoint the same auditors to do non-audit work. Mm -hmm. Now, whom do you think the auditors will have the loyalty? The directors. Directors, because they are getting big money out of them, isn't it? Yeah. That was the problem. <coughs> that was the problem. So, because of that, the, the, what happened was almost every scenario, the directors are getting big money, uh, the auditors are getting big money to directors' appointment, and therefore they were under obligation to the directors. So they did not do the right job in the companies like Enron. So now, in order to avoid that kind of a situation happening, audit committee is given the responsibility to ensure that the external auditors don't do too much of non-audit work. They can do, but they are not totally relying on the non-audit work because they must be more on the audit work. That is how mm -hmm. the corporate governance came and said, this is where we have to keep our external auditor. What is the role of the internal auditors? <coughs> What's the role of the internal? Who is the internal auditor? Uh... External auditor, we know his, his, his uh, main concern is to give an opinion on the financial reports that has been prepared, financial statement that has been prepared by the board of directors. Yeah. Right? That is the that is their main responsibility. What is the responsibility of the internal auditor? Um, it's to ensure that um, controls. Yeah, are... that's correct. They will review all the control systems in the company, risk management yeah. systems in the company, and they will tell. They, they also report to the they report to the audit committee. They don't report to the shareholders. They report to the audit committee. Internal auditor, head so of internal auditors. External audit auditors mm -hmm. and internal auditors, they mm -hmm. both report, report to the audit committee. Yeah. No, external auditors report to the shareholders. Oh, yeah. Shareholders. Oh, yeah. Internal auditor reports to the audit committee. Yeah. Right. <coughs> the internal auditors are part of the company. They are employees of the company, mostly. Of course, you can outsource the internal audit also. But their yeah. responsibility is to look at the internal control systems, look at the risk management systems, look at the financial reporting also, and to report to the audit committee of any lapses. Yeah. So finally, to provide timely, accurate, trustworthy reporting, because one of the problems was they provided untrustworthy reports, not timely. So these are the 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 reasons behind the corporate governance, and to encourage more proactive involvement of owners. Who are the owners? The shareholders. shareholders. Because the shareholders, otherwise they were not taking any interest. They pay, they give the money, they get a dividend, they get an annual report, they are quite happy, they don't even ask, they don't know whether the company is living or not. But now, the, the corporate governance says they must get involved. There are two types of shareholders mm -hmm. we find in companies. One is you and me, who are individual shareholders. We go and put our money, if the company does well, we will get rewarded. If the company does badly, we will not get rewarded. We might even lose our money. You might get a scolding from your husband. I might get a scolding from my wife. But that's the end of the story because it is my money. It is your money. Yeah. But there's another kind of people who invest money, whom we call institutional investors. Yeah. Institutional. They are, you know, your provider, your pension, money is given by your company to another pension fund, they come and invest money in company. Now, if the company fails, they are the people who have made the decision, but who will suffer? 
who will suffer? Mm -hmm. You will suffer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Your pension that is getting affected. Yeah. <clears throat> who made the decision? Not you, but some other company, pension fund or something like that. So they are called institutional yeah. investors. They make decisions on behalf of others. If they make a wrong decision, that decision impact will be for many others, not only for you, not only for them, but for the others. And therefore, now it is a requirement, particularly the institutional investors should take a very, very active role inside the company's affairs. Okay, yeah. So the way that it should happen is the chairman of the company should invite particularly the institutional shareholders to come for the meeting, ask questions, get clarification, encourage them to make any suggestions. So they are proactively involved in the company. That is the idea of the corporate governance. Yep, okay. Mm -hmm. So generally, the corporate governance is all to do Corporate governance is all to do with good conformance and performance. Conformance mm -hmm. means you, you comply with all rules and regulations and everything. But just following rules and regulations is not good enough. You must perform. You must take certain amount of risk. You must make certain strategic decisions. And all that, the responsibility is the board of directors, and that's the way the corporate governance will link with the strategy. The UK model, there are many models. The UK model is what we call principle-based. The American model mm -hmm. is what we call rule-based. Rule-based mm -hmm. means it's a law. It's a law. By an act of the, 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 the U, USA, it, uh, it is forced on you to apply the corporate governance principle. But UK and many other countries follow what we call principle based. What do you think is better, law or principle based? Well, it depends. Um, mm -hmm. Rule based, you would think that yes, so everyone mm -hmm. will make sure that they stick by the law, yeah. but it can be really unflexible. Yeah. It's yeah. Not all businesses. That's correct. Work. The the problem is when you say rule based, when it's law, you and I know, we know how to escape the law, isn't it? We know how to escape yeah. the law. We, we, there are a lot of loopholes in the law. We will escape yes. and we say we are complied with the law. When you say principle mm -hmm. based, it's much more wider. No rule, you must comply with every right principle to the spirit of the law. So principle based mm -hmm. is more wider more wide, right? Only thing you can't put a person in jail for not following the principle base, but law you can, but principle base means you have a bigger response. You and I, being SIMA qualified accountants, being SIMA accountants, we have to fall in line with good principles, good morality. So UK model is based on what we call principle base. And it's a many number of reports. You don't need to memorize these reports. There are many reports that happen. Cadbury, Hamper, Greenbury, mm -hmm. all the reports came. And I, the so in the exams, they won't ask no. uh, about the reports? Yeah, unlikely. Uh, they, might just, uh, they might just say something about it. But the culmination of all these reports is ultimately the UK Corporate Governance Code 2020 which is the latest, latest we have. Generally, the UK model is considered to be the mother model for the entire world. There are oh. other models, but the UK model is supposed to be one of the, the greater models, and uh, it is considered to be a, a kind of a model to be followed. So wherever there is no particular corporate governance model, we can take lot of applications from the UK model.
in our exam in SIMA, we are mostly tested on UK model. The USA model, as I said, it's a rule based, it's law, it's called SOX Act. Sarbanes and Oxley Act of 2002, it applies to every U.S. public corporation, it's compulsory. Yeah. Then we have the South African model, it's called the King's Report, it takes a so wide... So sorry. Yeah. Yes. The Sarbane and Oxley Act, um, so whether the companies are listed or not, now it applies to are... it applies to all US public corporations. All the companies operating in US, whether it's listed or not. So if I'm a sole trader? No, sole traders are not corporations, not company. So it um, has to be public limited. No, company. it can be a private limited company also. Okay. If it's a sole trader, if it's a partnership. Pardon? Partnerships and sole traders and all that, they're not corporations. No, they are so not, not corporations. They are not corporates. They are not companies. Sole traders, partnerships, they are not corporates. They are not companies. But USA model applies for every company in US. And also, even a UK company will be listed in the US stock exchange. The SOX model will apply. Even if it's a UK company, it will be listed in the New York stock exchange then the USA model will apply. Okay, yeah. Then we have the South African model. As I said, it's called the Kins Report. It takes a wider approach because it was done somewhere in 2009 when Nelson Mandela was there. Uh, basically, it looks at a better, wider approach of even the social consequences, environment consequences, even it look at the economic activities. So it, it encourages lot of activity by shareholders and also the financial press, the media. Mm -hmm. Lot of prominence given to the media to expose the companies if they are not doing the right thing. Okay, yeah. So there is another model for global investment which is called Organization of Economic Cooperation Development. That is for entire world a kind of a model called the OECD model. So it works on a couple Sorry, of things. For, yeah. So organization for economic. Economic cooperation and development. And development, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so basically, again, it deals with five principles. The shareholder rights, equitable treatment of shareholders. That means whether you are a large shareholder or a small shareholder you should be equally informed, same rights. Rights of stakeholders, stakeholders are people other than, not other than shareholders, including the shareholders, but all who have an interest in the long-term strategy as a company. It's concerned about the disclosure and transparency, the truthfulness, and it, it's concerned about the responsibilities of the board. Okay. So when does the OECD apply? OECD when does global o investment? OECD applies wherever there is no corporate governance model, particularly when it comes for international investments, it may be the OECD that applies. Because UK applies for UK companies, US applies for US companies, South Africa applies for South African companies. If you don't have a corporate structure, corporate governance model, the OECD model will apply. Okay? Yeah. Oh. So it's the, not the UK model that applies if there's no corporate governance model, it's the OECD. Yeah, the, because now for, for example in our country we have our own model, mm -hmm. Sri Lankan model. There are certain countries where they may not have a model and then they will take up the OECD model and apply. Okay. OECD model is a, a general model for any, any, any country they can apply. Will they ask questions about OECD in the... They might the ask world. about the five principles. Okay. Five principles what I discussed. Yeah. Right. So, 
Now, if you look at a board, according to the UK model and many countries model, the board is one board, but it has executive directors and it has non-executive directors. Who are executive mm -hmm. directors? Who are non-executive directors? Executive directors mm -hmm. will work in other employees in the company. Right. They, they have their own... They look after... So you have your sales director, finance director, so they yeah. look after departments yeah. in the company. Yeah, right. They are employees of the company. They are full-time employees of the company. They are responsible for the... to develop the strategy and to work for the strategy, right? So basically the head of the executive directors are chief executive officer, CEO. CEO and the other executive directors like the finance director, HR director, IT director, they are the people who are working full time and they are paid a remuneration for working full time inside the company. So what's the difference between CEO you and managing director normally the earlier the old companies they have a managing director but now the new companies have the ex, the ceo almost the same role but some companies we do have a ceo and also a managing director also they are basically designation mm -hmm. but the the corporate governance recognizes the ceo as the key person who is responsible okay. for the performance of the company. CEO, Chief Executive Officer. Yeah. Some companies, they call it Managing Director. Sometimes they call it MD, CEO. Uh, different, mm -hmm. different names are used. Uh, but generally, CEO is the recognized post, the person who is responsible to develop the corporate strategy, to develop the long-term strategy. What is the role of the non-executive directors? Who are they? Who are they, non-executive directors? The part-time. They work part-time. Yeah. They don't work part-time. They, they don't work part-time. They participate at the board meetings and at various committee meetings. They may be working elsewhere or they may be retired people. They only participate at the board meeting and various committee meetings like audit committee, remuneration committee, <laughs> nomination committee. They are not even part-time workers. They but does have, that work to balance, to balance the... Yeah, they basically... Independent. They, they, are, they are independent people. Their role is to challenge the strategy that has been developed by the executive directors and the CEO. So they bring a lot of experience lot of knowledge from outside and they will ask, hey Nish, why are you trying to do this way? Why don't you do this way? They bring lot of experience. That's okay. their role. Now, I being a retired person, I work for some other companies here as a non-executive director. The, my role is to actively participate and also, as you said, to give that balance. Because otherwise, the people who are inside the company, sometimes they don't see the outside view. They don't see what is mm -hmm. happening outside. They are too much aligned and they have their affection to the people inside the company. They may be sometimes blind towards certain things happening. But being an outsider who comes and sits on the board will see certain areas of the company not properly happening. And for that purpose, the UK model and many other models says there has to be non-executive director. And the UK yeah. model even go to the extent of saying the non-executive director should be more than the executive directors in the board. The number of non-executive directors so should be more than the executive or the majority should be non-executive directors. Why? Because the, otherwise the executive directors will dominate. Right? If you have one yeah. or two people, they will dominate, they will say, you don't know anything, what do you know, and all that. But when you have more non-executive directors, they can even, you know, stop a certain decision being taken because whether you are executive director or a non-executive director, the board is collectively responsible. 
once you become a non executive director you can say i am a non executive director so i don't know anything what happened no you can't say that you are collectively responsible so if you are not in agreement with the decision of the executive director you can oppose you can wait you can vote against the decision so and they have the same legal responsibility for the management of the company and strategic performance so whether you are executive director or a non executive director it does not matter when you take that position of a board of director you are working for one company and that is why we call it a unitary board even though it is a mix of executive directors and non executive directors it's a unitary board it's one board that's what the uk model is all about so mm -hmm. the board is the board leader or the board's captain is the chairman chairman now remember ceo is the leader of the executive directors but yeah. executive directors and non executive directors together forms the entire board in that entire board the leader is the chairman does the ce is so <coughs> On the board, you've got all the different directors yeah. and the CEO as well. Yeah. CEO is also there, but the board is headed <coughs> by the chairman. Board is headed and by the, the chairman. chairman. Is he a, he's is a non executive? He's a non executive director. He's a non executive director. He heads the board. He will tell, he will prepare the agenda will work according to agenda he will allow the board directors board executive directors and non executive directors to present their views to talk to stop when they are talking unnecessary things to manage the board meeting he is the 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 key person earlier we had and CEO, who does he report to the pardon, shareholders pardon? yeah all directors report to the shareholders <coughs> All directors are appointed by the shareholders. All directors report to the shareholders. Directors are always appointed at the annual general meeting. Even if they are appointed interim, the, at the annual general meeting, the shareholders will have to ratify. Shareholders can decide mm -hmm. to appoint. Shareholders can decide to remove the directors. Yeah. Okay. But to assist that one, they have a committee called nominations committee. Yeah. nominations committee because the shareholders don't know anything what's happening inside the company so there's a mm. committee called nominations committee that committee has both executive directors and non-executive directors sitting on that committee majority again non-executive directors majority non-executive directors this is the only committee where you will have both executive directors and non-executive directors sit in out of the, one of the main committees. There are three main so committees. What, is, hmm? yeah. what about the remuneration committee? Yeah, I'll come to that part. There are three main okay. committees. One is the nomination committee, one is the audit committee, one is the remuneration committee. Audit and remuneration committee only non-executive directors. Third committee, the nomination committee, will have both non-executive directors and executive directors. What is the reason? The nominations committee will have the right, not, not the right, they will recommend to the shareholders to remove a certain director, maybe due to lack of good performance, to appoint a new director, or uh, maybe one of the directors are retiring, executive directors, and they want to appoint a success. Now imagine you are the second in command in the finance division, right? And your finance director is retiring. So who knows best about you? Is it the non-executive directors or the executive directors? The executive director. Executive director. So that is why they have executive directors in that committee because they know who is best to replace so and so in that position. So that is why they have executive directors in the board structure, the, in the nomination committee. The next committee, what you asked was the remuneration committee. Why, what is the purpose of the remuneration committee? 
remuneration committee, as I said, it's all non-executive directors. They are there because in the earlier scenario, the executive director, they themselves were deciding the salary, the remuneration, the pension, the bonus for themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, you, I, and many people are in the board. When your remuneration is decided, you might not participate and others will participate and decide the salary for remuneration for 2017 for niche. And when mm -hmm. my remuneration is decided, I may not participate, but you all will decide. But if I object for your one, what will you do? You will object for my one now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So because of that, the, the, the earlier system was, you look after me, I will look after you. So everyone, uh -huh. you know, was getting big remuneration packages. And this was one of the biggest problems in UK, biggest problems in USA, biggest problems in all over the world. Directors enjoying unlimited perks, unlimited facilities. At least to bring some kind of a system into that one. Now, in each of these big companies, listed companies, they have something called a remuneration committee. Okay, yeah. And those non-executive directors will set certain guidelines. They will say, okay, next year, in line with inflation, we will increase the director's remuneration of the executive directors, right? Not the non-executive director. Executive director, they will say, we will increase in line with inflation 6% for all. But they will have key performance indicators for you, key performance indicators for me. You have fulfilled your key performance indicators and they will say, okay, Nish will get another 8% above the inflation. Kuma will not get anything about the inflation because Kuma has not complied with the delivered. key performance indicators or delivered. So that way, now the, the remuneration of the executive directors are decided on a standard procedure, on a, on a systemized way, and that is done by non-executive directors. Yeah. So they, they cannot be challenged. So that way, they, they recommend and the shareholders will approve that one. So to that extent, the, the, the remuneration is much more transparent now compared to what it was earlier. Yeah. And finally, the audit committee is a big committee. It is looking after the internal audit. It is looking after the internal controls. It is looking after the risk management. If there is no risk management committee, it will look after the, the what we call whistleblowing. When the people have some complaint to make, they will look after that one. Uh -huh. Sorry, you said internal audit, internal control, risk management. Yeah, and also something called whistleblowing. Whistleblowing yeah, whistle means when you have something to complain, you can't go and complain it to your own boss. You might get sacked. So uh, there is a, a kind of independent body, the internal, the audit committee, to which you can go and report. And the risk management is only if there's no risk management if committee. If there's no risk management committee, yes. They are generally there to review everything and to give that assurance to the auditor, to the board of directors, that everything is working well or not working well. They have the independency. They can do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Okay. So that's basically the board structure, what we have been looking at. And uh, the, this is what we call unitary board model. There are certain other countries. <coughs> They have different, so the advantages, this is the question in your paper, advantages of unitary board. Because it's one board, one responsibility, the NADs will take a more proactive approach because they know if something goes wrong, they are also legally responsible even though they are non-executive directors. And therefore, they will have a right to participate in decision making chairman will give them the right to put up their waves or to dissent from the decision, all that kind of a thing. And therefore, NADs will be very proactive because they know they have an equal responsibility if anything goes wrong. They will ask a lot of questions 
and that asking questions will make it better decision because they are one board they will have a better relationship what are the disadvantages disadvantages because they are also involved in decision making for example the company might decide to acquire a new company company might decide to go into a new market in china because they are also involved in decision after that they can't criticize the executive directors because they are also part of the same body and because they are not working in the company they need lot of time to study because executive directors they are very familiar with the surrounding they know what's happening around but these people don't know so they take lot of time to make decisions they need lot of information and there can be a kind of a, a scenario where they may be under prepared or they may not be fully prepared to take that decision because the executive directors and non executive directors are working in the same company in the same board shareholders may think you know those fellows will look after our interests and therefore we don't need to do too many things and they might not get involved as much as they would have because they believe the non executive directors will do the job for them so these are some advantages some disadvantages of the deputy board another board in the german they have something called two tier board now this is also can be a question two tier board one supervisory board another one the management board so just like the executive directors it's the management board so the non executive director i have heard of the two tier three tier boards Pardon? so these can be um exam questions yeah these can be exam questions this uh, this is okay, not yeah. in uk but in other countries they have adopted this model so some argue this is better model than the uk model some say the uk model is better than that everyone each has its own advantages and disadvantages here there are two yeah. boards virtually the supervisory board is like the non executive board right so they 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 don't have executive function they take decisions and they pass the decisions for the second board second board is responsible for implementation and to carry out day to day running so the supervisory board um it's like a non executive board. it has no executive function it has no executive function but it will take a broad view of the company's affair so they will they will have sufficient independent knowledge they are not exactly the the they are not exactly the the non executive uh, uh, model because they have some <laughs> other people also maybe a bank representative because the banks are given some loans maybe a, a union representative so they take a different kind of a view of the company and they might supervise the management board management board will run the company the executive director but these people will supervise and say hey why did you do this they are not participating at the same level in the decision making so they are independent yeah. so you can hold them responsible if anything goes wrong because it is the management board who is doing but supervisory board can't escape us because they are there to guide the management yeah then we have the three tier board this is what um, we before you move on yeah. so the supervisory board do they take decisions and then they pass it on to management board to implement they, they basically decide the policy for the implementation of the policy they will put it to the supervisor the management board policies will be done by the supervisory board okay and the management board might execute those things or when the management board wants to do something they will go to the supervisory board and get their permission yeah then we have the three tier board this is what we see it in japanese companies in japanese companies the policy board 
functional board and what we call a monocratic board. So policy board, again, it's like the non-executive directors. It's they take the policy decisions, long-term strategic issues. They might decide, for, for example, a manufacturing company, whether they want to distribute their goods to agents or whether they want to do it through their own sales outlet. So they will take long-term strategic issues. They might decide whether to go for an equity share capital or they might go for a long-term loan. Then yeah. the functional board is basically the HR director, finance director. They will run the company on a day-to-day -day basis. Then they have, just like in UK, we have this queen who is the ultimate authority. It's a, a kind of a monocratic board. It's a very symbolic. It's a more of a ceremonial board. Ceremonial board. They, they they basically they will they are very seniors in the in the country. Uh, they will advise the policy board in making various policy decisions. They are very senior people. Very, uh, they don't get involved in too many details, but they will look at the policy decisions of the company, like our Queen Elizabeth, right? She won't get involved in day-to-day -day running of the government, but she is the head of the, the country, head of the government. So same scenario here. They So obviously, with three boards, generally the decision-making will be very slow, but will be very thorough, because it comes to three levels of boards, three levels of board. They sit independently. And with three levels of board, the decision that comes up will be a very, very quality decision. So directors, basically, they are, they are expected to promote the interest of employees once they join the board. Because Japanese concept is employees, and they look after their employees, or they, they, they are concerned about the employees. So this is the way that they run the company. Yep. So if it's a two-tier board or a three-tier board, the advantage is there is always a separation of duties. So uh, there is, it's not a one board sitting, many board sitting. So because of that, the, the, you are not under pressure to, you know, do something. You have the independency. The supervisor will have the capacity to be an effective guard because you are now no longer in the board, in the same board. So you can, you know, put your views much more strongly because you are in a different board and you can say this is not good or whatever it may be. Um, they will look after the needs of the stakeholders. They, because the, the, normally the executive director, they generally tend to look after themselves. So the, having a supervisory board, they will look at a broader view, what will happen to the environment, what will happen to the society, all that. And they will be somewhat agile on the strategy because they are independent. They can be very, very agile. They can challenge. They can, um, you know, discard. They can recommend. Yeah. So they will be very much actively involved in that kind of thing. Uh -huh. yeah. you know, authority, finally, when something goes wrong, uh, it's very difficult to put the blame on particular party. There can be many people wanting to, you know, saying it's so and so only decided we did that and all that. Uh, there can be lack of accountability. And sometimes the executive board, they know a lot of information. They might not give that information to the supervisory board. So supervisory board will have to make decisions without proper information because all the information is with the managerial board lack of independence because you are working in different compartments decision taken without TDs may lack full information the people who know all about the company the executive directors so when another set of directors take policy decisions without full information the the decision may be somewhat half big or semi big and the executive yeah. directors may not even support the decisions uh, yeah. sometimes when it is taken at the top level. So there can be a lot of confusion, a lot of accountability problems, all that. So I think still, overall, uh, unitary board is still the best model. That is why we consider the UK model 
So basically, yeah. the, okay. the boards are subject to a review by themselves. <laughs> Every board must review themselves independently to see whether I have done my job. Independent appraiser. Also a collective appraiser to see whether everyone has done their job. Chairman and CEO should be appraised and the big companies... But who does the appraisal? Appraisal, the audit, the, the, the remuneration, the, sorry, the nomination committee will do the appraisal. Nomination committee will do the appraisal. And generally, your remuneration will be linked to the thing. Chairman, actually, chairman is not a non-executive director. Sorry, not executive director. So, chairman and the non-executive directors are paid per board meeting attendance. They are not supposed to get any performance-oriented remuneration. Executive directors, a significant portion of the remuneration will come in form of performance-oriented bonuses. So, you have to perform and earn. Non-executive directors, they are not responsible for performance and they should never, never get involved in performance-oriented bonus. Because in that case, they are not independent. So, yeah. just to summarize, non-executive directors should be people of integrity, people with knowledge, people with skills, and people with time availability. I mean, you should not be a non-executive director for 10 companies. Because you will never be able to do a good job. Right? So, I think this is so good in, enough. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so um, afterwards I can see you've got different types of boards. So, yeah. what does that mean? Does that just, the types of boards are just a different makeup of the board or the different... Yeah, again, different types of boards, you know, the, the, the various qualities of a board. If you look at, this is what they call an effect board. Right? So, the, the, this kind of a board, very clear with their competencies, they know the KPIs, they will focus on the stakeholders, all that. If you go to the oh, next... So, these are the different types. Different of types. Of the, 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 yeah, this kind of a board, they don't, uh, they are not very competent, they are just mere rubber stand. Yes, yes, kind okay. of a people. Yeah. You know, then there is some people, like, you know, firefighters. They, they... Yeah. Here, when it comes, they will do everything, but during the other time, they will sleep. So, then there are some people talk only. They come and talk, 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 no action. So, different yeah, attributes yeah. of both, this is what it is all about in that one. Yes. So, I think in summary, I think we have the, we have the slides. You can go to the slide. I think in yeah. summary, the corporate governance, I think we are done enough. We will look at some other yeah. questions in the next time, and we will uh, move on from I that will... one. Yeah, I will do the question. And you send it to me. Yeah, questions. sure. Yes, and I've got I've got all the chapters we've done so far that I need to do the questions. So okay, we'll, sure, sure. And then yeah. um, I'll send it to you. Yes. Yeah, right. So when is your next free day, um, uh, Nate? Uh, Thursday. Thursday. What time? What Thursday morning. Uh, six thirty. Yeah, six thirty should be all right. Yeah, Thursday I think I should be able to make it 6.30, yeah. Yeah, 6.30 is all right for Thursday. Yeah, and can you send me the slides and Yeah, the I'll questions. send you the slides. I will see what is the area we are going to do and I'll send you the slides at the time. Sure. Okay then, I'll see you on 6.30. So the 630. questions you're sending me are... Of, Pardon? Yes, um, the questions you're sending me are first intuition questions. Yeah, they are good yeah. questions. Yeah. Yes, okay. Well, yeah, they are very good. I'm um, taking a mix. Some questions in the corporate governance, they are good. Some questions, BPP is good, so I'm taking a mix of various areas. Okay. I'll see you on Thursday, 6.30. See you Thursday, 6.30. Thank, Thank you very yeah. much. Bye. And Bye. good luck for today. Thank you. Bye. Bye.